episode 32 of the Yarn Curator podcast. My name is Naomi. Welcome to my channel where I like to talk about all things yarny and fibery. As you might notice, today I am joined by my beautiful sister, Zoe, of the Felicity Yarn Studio. Hey, y'all. And... We have all of her <laughs> here with us as well. Yeah, we are also co-hosted with Holly and... Zoe and I just finished recording a call in which we announced the winners to our Steak Along Knit Along that we did in the last quarter-ish mm -hmm. of 2020. I don't know. Time ceased to exist last year. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah uh, so congratulations to all the winners and thank you to everybody who decided to participate and yeah. join us in our little Steak Along. So. So yeah, I was planning on sitting down and recording this afternoon anyways. And so Zoe and I, for whatever reason, whenever we get on a video <laughs> chat with each other, we end up having like a marathon gab session anyways. <laughs> it's just easier to yeah. get it all out in one go. So. Yeah. <laughs> so she's gonna um, add some color commentary <laughs> to today's episode. <laughs> To start off, I feel like I'm all boobs here on the screen. <laughs> uh, well, hold that thought because boobs are going to feature heavily in today's content. Cool. <laughs> I was watching um, <clears throat> another channel this morning because I went hard down like the costume hole mm. and I was trying out a new channel, but she was talking about like wearing. 1940s undergarments for a week and so as she said this episode will heavily feature the word breast chest and bosom um so i have a similar disclaimer today indeed <laughs> um so yeah what why don't you tell everyone what you're working on uh, well right now i'm knitting on my second sock out of some hand spun. I finished the first sock already. Um, I am normally a two at a time sock knitter, but with this being a hand spun skein of yarn, I didn't want to split it into two balls just because I wanted, I don't know, I wanted the yarn to play out naturally, I guess, how it was spun up. Um, but yeah, this is just some hand spun. It's about a sport to DK weight. So I'm doing like 60 stitches. Um, it was from a braid by Wound Up Fiber Arts in the ghosting colorway. Uh, and yeah, I'm really liking how these are coming along. I did weigh out my yarn as I was going along on the first one. So I should be on pace to use up like a good chunk of this yarn nice yeah so um yeah i really haven't gotten much done since i recorded my podcast late last week um i might have one or two other things i can pull out sitting next to me that are kind of they're both socks but they're not as exciting so <laughs> anyway yeah well speaking of socks i have I do have a finished object. I can only find one half of the finished object. <laughs> so for those of you who are new here, my husband does most of the laundry in our house. And so I could only find one half of my finished sock out of the laundry basket. So I'm not sure where the other half is, which is weird because we did every single scrap of laundry this weekend. Like there is no... For the next 30 minutes, there is no dirty clothes in our house. Um, but yeah, I finished a shorty sock out of Zoe's hand dyed yarn. This is from her 2018 advent yeah. calendar. And yeah, this that is was the, main. the first advent that I did, I believe. Yes. And so I have already used the minis mostly in the Fade into Advent Shawl by Lisa Ross. So um, in an effort to kickstart my knitting mojo, I took evasive maneuvers and cast on a sock. 
if you're also new here, I don't really enjoy sock knitting. It's just the process is not fulfilling to me. Um, but you just haven't knit with, enough socks. Oh, I have. <laughs> I have. And I will attest, I have seen a picture of both finished socks. She has actually finished both of them. Yeah. I'll put in a picture um, when I'm editing of both of them together. Uh, so yeah, I just did 64 stitches on US size one needles. I did a short row heel. This is the New Depths heel by Becky Sorensen. And I still think I like the fit of heel flap and gusset the best. Um, I need to try that heel. Um. Because I'm, I'm with you on the heel flap and gusset as far as the fit goes. I have to say in terms of like process, I enjoy doing the short row heel better than the heel flap and gusset. It feels less disruptive to the process and I hate picking up stitches. Um, so that's nice. I completely uh, agree with that as far as heels go. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the only modification I did to her heel pattern is as you pick up your wrap stitches for the short rows. Well, I did German short rows. Mm -hmm. um, but as you pick up your wraps or your turns, I twisted through the back loop of the stitch just to tighten it up some because mm -hmm. um, it was looking a little gapy. Indeed. But yeah, that is rounded toe and I have new socks. So that's nice. <laughs> um, we'll get you a box of socks eventually <laughs> like 10 years from now um but yeah I just a little shorty ankle socks because I have a pair of boots I like to wear to work I will say this much I have a pair of boots that I love to wear to work and they are a lot more comfortable in hand knit mm -hmm. socks versus commercial socks mm -hmm. so we'll give them a pro in that regard <laughs> I do have another mostly yeah. I guess this counts as a hoe which is more socks <laughs> but I too am working on some hand spun socks these is out of some baby doll south down south yes. down baby doll it's baby doll uh, south down oh I always mix it up I had to verify it as well but yes so you and I are both spinning this as part of a breed study, um, and I should be putting out a video about this type of sheep here soon, um, now that I have mostly finished knitting with it. So I uh, yeah. just have to picture the toe together, but I didn't feel like doing that yesterday. Eh, that'll take you like five minutes to finish up. I, I was yeah. like, uh, I feel like working on this. My, so, this is well, probably going to be my next pair of socks is my yeah. scheme. Yeah. Uh, we're both working the same sheep from the same vendor. So this is from a dyer called Apothecary. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember the name of this colorway, but I did a three ply fractal. Um, and so I cast on, I did mine top down. I just prefer it to toe up. I do too. Um, I only did toe up so I could get as much as possible out of this one. But. Yeah. So um, this is what it looks like together. If I were to straddle the repeat, it would go like. Mm -hmm. like oh, that. that's one thing I didn't mention last week when I talked about this. How did you divide your braid? I divided my braid in thirds vertically. And then I left one third whole. Mm -hmm. The second third I divided in half. And then the third third I divided six times. Mm -hmm. Something like that. I don't know. I took video of it. It'll be in a video eventually okay. how I divide. Because I did mine. I did, yeah, the first third whole from top to bottom. Then the second one, I think I divided into four or five sections. And then the next one, I think I tried to get 10. I don't know. So 
I even asked Jason, and he's a lot more analytical minded than I am, trying to understand if the way that I divided it up makes it a true fractal based off of the mathematical mm. principles of fractals. Um, I don't know, neither one of us like had the brain power <laughs> to work it out. Uh, but yeah, I think I divided mine a little bit more than yours. Yeah. Um, so it should be, should be a more subtle kind of shifting of the colors. But yeah, so mine is, it's a little bit like more defined stripes. But when you really get in, I mean, you can see there's some. Yeah, it shifts. Um, yeah, and it's pretty subtle in person versus on camera. It's pretty stark. Mm -hmm. I, the only thing that I'm like, oh, is if where I'm ending is just getting back to the start of the repeat here. So I kind of wish You've I'm not remitting the stock, but <laughs> I yeah. kind of match almost the same. They're, yeah. They're cousins. I that's what I like about hand spun socks though is they're not going to match up perfectly no. and be like exact replicas of each other. So like and this was just a braid that was like speckle dyed, so it's kind of random in the color distribution. But so oh, this is what I have left. I think it's a little I think it's around 30 grams, which should be more than enough to put in heels. Mm -hmm. And then I'll probably use if there if there are poultry leftovers, maybe like a brim and a hat or something. Mm. So yeah, and you talked about this in your last episode. Um, our mom and aunt are all wanting to tackle their first socks. Yes. Uh, well, except for Aunt Mary, she's knit yeah. socks. But, but uh, the rest, everyone else is intimidated. Which I understand. Um, I was too when I first started knitting. So, oh, this is a funny story. So, my coworker, she brought in a magazine the other day because her and her husband are thinking about moving to New Mexico when they retire. And she's like two years away from retirement. Right. Uh, but, anyways, so they get this like arts magazine for what's going on in the arts in New Mexico. And one of them had an ad for someone selling, like, chunky weight hand-knit hats. Um, so she's showing me this ad, and we're chit-chatting about it. So there's a few funny things off it. She was like, I know you would never be fancy enough to knit with Merino. And I was like, oh, that's all I use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what does she think you're knitting with? I don't know. She just doesn't know, like, about yarn sure. or fiber. So it was really, that was really cute. And That's then uh, her husband was like telling her like, yeah, you got to get Naomi making hats to sell them, you know, like tell her I'll back her business. Um, and I was like, well, you know, I really just knit for me, blah, 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 blah. But then uh, this last week she came into work and her husband now wants to learn how to knit himself. Mm -hmm. um, and he's like, you think Naomi could show me how to knit a hat? And I'm like, yeah, I'll totally teach Dave to knit that's no problem at all but uh she made me crack up laughing because she was like slow down Dave maybe not start with a hat that sounds really advanced let's start out with maybe socks <laughs> no that's the other way around <laughs> hats are easy yeah <laughs> and I was like oh no that's we'll funny. start with a hat yeah yeah so I need to go through extra needles this weekend and I'll give them some stuff to learn yeah that's actually probably hats probably the like one of the easiest things to learn or it's not like bogging you down to do like a whole long scarf I remember a scarf was one of the first things I did did and was like after like six inches of a scarf you're like I'm over this like mm -hmm. I need some gratification and oh yeah, I can eat Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say there's a lot of elements to a sock to learn. It's yeah, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I uh, I, I was like laughing on the inside. I was like, I'm not gonna like rain on their learning to knit parade. No, but, no. 
But it's just you want to learn socks is the first thing you want to learn to knit. Go for it. That's what I yeah. say. <laughs> Um, but it just tickled me that that's what yeah. she went to. Um, so anyways, that's it for my socks. And it's probably be it for socks for me for 2021. <laughs> However. <laughs> you said that with the gray socks, though. I did. But I, mean, I spun this yarn to make socks. Yeah. I spun it and that's what I wanted to make it for. Yeah. Um, I do have to say I started this first sock like six times um which was enough also to make me swear off socks i originally did it with a contrast cuff um but the gauge was coming up bigger so i ended up frogging it but i had like i probably had like from this much knit already of the sock when i decided to frog it that is the other thing if you're using hand spun that's not quite like pure sock weight fingering weight these knit up really quickly. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like I started these last night and I'm already, you know, halfway through the foot. But yeah, I think um, the second one I did in about a day, mm -hmm. give or take. Mm -hmm. All right. So moving in to whips. Um, the last time I sat down and recorded, I was kind of waffling about what to do with my Love Note sweater. Mm. And so this is it. Cute. And I like it. I like it a lot. And I really um, like that color. Yeah. Yes. So this is from Sincere Sheep and it's in the college ring colorway. It's like a really pretty, like Merlot wine mm -hmm. color. One of my schemes is darker than the other. And so. I cast on, or I did the collar in the darker color, and then I kind of faded it in at the bottom. And I'll do the same with the sleeves. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I was just going to say it's cute. You sound like you have Thanks. some background noise over there. My neighbor is using a circle saw. You can actually look out of my window into his garage and watch exactly what he's doing right now because it's cool and we're packed in like sardines. Mm -hmm. um, but he's nice, so I can't complain too much. He feeds the neighborhood stray in addition to us. Uh -huh. And he has a little chihuahua named Romeo who likes to come over. <laughs> so I don't know his name. I know his dog's name, but I don't know his name. I yeah there's one or two neighbors that I don't know their actual name but Jason and I have nicknames for them and I'm like I know at some point I'm gonna call them by their nickname yes yeah. <laughs> it's, it's gonna be bad so anyways the last time I recorded I talked about how with this pattern my bust size kind of falls in between sizes and the mm -hmm. amount of ease I would like so my smart plan was to do bus starts and I worked the wrong version of bus starts for what I wanted to accomplish. So the type of bus starts I did added length and not width. And so like, let me get back into it. So once again, we'll feature heavily the word chest, bosom, breast. <laughs> So there's two types of bust starts. Vertical bust starts add width across. So you're adding, adding and decreasing stitches here to create extra fabric. Horizontal bust starts add length. So like if you're someone with a fuller bust, it prevents, it creates more fabric so it doesn't ride up because uh -huh. you need more fabric to cover your chest if you have a bigger bus is the name because of the way that they're made i don't know like, and I, but, the fabric that they're making like i don't know why they're called what they're called because it's confusing to me that a vertical bus start would add would go this way yeah and a horizontal bus start goes this way it's got to be the way that they're like worked or something it, would be my guess so anyways, 
I worked ones that added length mm -hmm. by doing a series of short rows across the chest. Mm -hmm. And I did it so it would add an extra, like, roughly two inches of fabric along my bust. Mm -hmm. I did it where it added an extra two inches. I do have to say, I was debating ripping back and doing the appropriate kind of bus start for what I wanted to achieve. But then I decided I didn't feel like picking up however many hundred stitches from ripping back. Once again, hate picking up stitches. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if it's from a lifeline or what. Right. Just don't enjoy it. So I just kept going uh, because otherwise I do enjoy the fit. Um, so I'm actually... So what I do like about it, even though it's not, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what I enjoy about this start is it creates like a little like hug for your bust. Like it just creates somewhat of a natural like curvature. Right. Like it, so <laughs> I've been all week, I've been like, how do I explain this? I mean, it makes sense. You're making more of a, a like, 3D shape where you yeah. do it instead of a flat piece of fabric that is going to distort. So. Oh, that looks good. Yeah. So I think it, I mean, I'm underneath overalls in a DK weight I sweater can still anyway. I see the, like, curvature. Yeah. Yeah, you can kind of see the line as it runs right here. But, yeah, it just adds, like, a nice little. To the to the bust. The other thing I think that I like about doing the bust adjustment is sometimes when you wear sweaters and you lift your arms up, this portion of fabric kind of rides up. Mm -hmm. But since it's that kind of cupped shape to it, when I lift my arms, right, I don't really get that, which I really like. So, right. so yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, that has been a frequent com frequent complaint of mine um, for so like, a lot yes. of, not, not only like the lifting, but just when people write the length for a pattern, be, when you have a full bust as we do, um, yes. they don't take into account the extra fabric that has to come like down and over your boob area your bust I suppose I should say <laughs> um to to get that same amount of length mm -hmm. like visually on your body like yeah it, I don't know I don't know if that explains it properly no but. I, it's one of those things too where I think if you're doing it it makes sense but as you try and explain it it doesn't make sense until you're in the practice of doing it but yeah I I, say, yeah in theory like thinking okay 12 inches of fabric should fall roughly the same on most bodies, but in reality, but it doesn't it always work out. Like, uh, like three inches over your boobs, then it's... And then back down and over and back into yeah. your waistline. Yeah. Because so. we're not all, we're not all straight boxes. Some of us have curves. <laughs> So anyways, I am actually really pleased with the way that fits. And I'm glad I just said, you know what? It's not what I wanted to achieve, but I still learned something. Yes. I was and say that. I think I will potentially incorporate some kind of chest shaping in the future. Uh, but yeah, I just have to pick up my sleeves now. Mm -hmm. And then we'll be done here soon. So... And I have to say, this this yarn is 100% Rambouillet, mm -hmm. and I think this might be my favorite rustic sheep breed so far that I've worked with. It's really soft and squishy, uh, and I think one of the other things about it that probably helps with that bust adjustment is it has a nice structure mm -hmm. without, so, yeah. That's my I'll say, I read. Yeah. I was going to say, with doing the, like, breed study with spinning, um, 
I haven't knit with too many breeds yet other than Merino, but I'm finding that a lot of the, at least with the spinning, I'm really enjoying the like springiness of a lot mm -hmm. of the breeds beyond Merino. Like not saying there's anything wrong with Merino and the reason it's the standard is it's softness, but I kind of like the personality that you get with some of these lesser known breeds as far as the way that, that they behave. Um, either I would, spinning or knitting, so. I would definitely agree with that. And I I think a lot of the, like, Hormo, the Rambouillet, Targi, uh, Elk, Targi, a few of the breeds we've either spun or, like, purchased yarn, they're just as soft as Merino to me. I agree with that, too. Um, there's, yeah, like, like my Brooklyn tweed sweater, which is I think Targi, I can wear that next to skin, next to skin, no <laughs> problems. Like I don't even think this south down is all that. I mean, maybe on on more sensitive areas it would be, but it's not itchy in any way. Like I have a, I'm a little more sensitive to the south yeah. down. I didn't think I was at first when I felt it in the braid form, mm -hmm. but now that one. I can it's see got... spun up. It's a little ropey. I'll, I will, but I think that's what makes it a good sock yarn. Yeah. Um, but... And that could just be my spinning, but. Yeah. I talked about, I want to try woolen, woolen spinning with the South Down also, because it's supposed to be a good breed for that. So. Nice. Anyway. Yeah. So, other than that, I only have one other whip. Can you tell I'm on to a color lately? <laughs> I get that way, too. It is, I did make progress on my stone prop. So, this is being knit out of Manistel Uruguay and their eggplant colorway. It's more purple that it shows up kind of blue on screen, but it's more like a true royal purple. And then I'm also knitting this out of hand spun yarn. This is Targi Silk and Bamboo, and it's an 801010 blend. Dyed by Zoe, spun by me. <laughs> the joint so, jam. <laughs> yes. And the last time I showed this off on the podcast. I was where Zoe's hand beaded stitch marker is. So, yes. right here. And what was holding me up was I had to do a bobble row and I calculated it. I had to work 78 bobbles that row. And each row has approximate, it had 478 stitches on the row. And you don't just do the bobble. There's a series of cables that you work with it, which you can cable without a cable needle, but it's just a lot. That's the tedious, yeah. Yes. And so that, that row alone to get through the bobble section took three nights. Ugh. Uh, Ugh. <laughs> yes. That being said, I want to make this, this top also. <laughs> And then I divided the sleeves and you pull off nearly, it's just under a hundred stitches for each sleeve that gets divided off. And so it's a much more enjoyable knit now that it's not as big. So I actually yeah. stopped because it had another bobble row and I decided to rest for a little bit. But all of this that I did of the body uh, last Monday, I binge watched Bridgerton and knit on this beast. And I do have to say, Knitting in a good period drama does help the mojo. So yes. maybe instead of socks, next time I just need another good period drama. Yes. So, yeah, I'm pleased with this. I'm glad it's moving again, but it's going to go back in timeout for a little bit. Yeah. I, I want to wrap up some of the other stuff I have going on. Um, and I also want to test on a few new things, but I don't... I don't feel like I can enjoy casting them on until I finish like one or two other things that are lingering. Yeah. I kind of am in the same boat where I'm enjoying everything, but at the same time I want 
I'm feeling the pull for something new, but I also want to complete some things before I dive in. So, so that's my knitting pretty much in a nutshell. Indeed. <laughs> um, we have both been reading some tawdry romance <laughs> novels. I don't know why it's the only thing I can get into currently with reading is just, they're not even all that cheesy. Some of them are pretty cheesy, but some of them. yes, but at the same time, it's like, I just need like fluffy escapism these days and <laughs> there, there's plenty out there to choose from. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, you and I have both been reading an author called Loretta Chase. And I think she's a pretty well known romance yeah. author. Yeah. So what's funny is you and I have read the same books in reverse now. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah I didn't realize uh, the I didn't realize the one that I started was the second book in the series, which whatever, now I'm reading the first, so And I've read the first book in the series and I'm now reading the second, but the books are called, the first book is called A Duke in Shining Armor, and the second book is Ten Things That I Hate About the Duke. Yes, they're the disgraces, they're disgraces, because the Duke <laughs> is disgrace, so yeah. that's cute, yeah. Which, so what I like about those books, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, what I like about them is they have, like, a good amount of, like, witty humor in them, the tete-a-tete between the main characters is usually pretty funny. Yeah, they're very witty banter and um, they're also like, yeah, they get a little steamy at times, but they're not, they're not the like dirtiest books that I've read in the last few no. months. Um, I don't, I don't even think they're as steamy as um, the Evie Dunmore books are. No which are, like, top-notch, in my opinion. <laughs> um, these are pretty close, second, I will say. I'm enjoying them a lot. And I appreciate that the um, the heroines are feisty and independent and not always innocent, virginal, you know, like... Yes. I mean, I get that there are certain tropes with this genre, but um, yeah, I like my my heroines to have a little gumption to them. Yeah, so these are mostly set in the Regency era, so the early 1800s, and so yes, there are very strict, like, social norms and mores around women, yes. but in, again, I do think this is what makes them enjoyable that you were hitting on. They're not they find ways to push the boundaries within the limits of right. respectability. Realistic, somewhat realistically. <laughs> I think that's what makes, I don't get into the, the books as much when they don't follow what would have been real social norms. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. It's harder for me to suspend disbelief when I know that some of this stuff wouldn't have Flown. <laughs> um, yeah. But speaking of things that don't fly, and I'm going to segue into a little bit of Bridgerton talk because because uh -huh. you were the subject of many text messages from me while I watched the show. So I read the first two Bridgerton books last year before I knew it was going to be a TV show, and I would remember like texting you. Not, like, telling you the plot or anything, but I was like, hmm, these, I don't know where, how I feel about these books. And then I watched the show, and I was like, hmm, the show, and then you finally watched the show, so. And I finished reading the first book already. I flew through it. Uh, <laughs> but, so, in the show, the thing that, like, aside from all the things that stand out that wouldn't have flown back in the past, the one that gets me most is the sister Eloise, yeah. like, running over to the friend's house in the middle of the night, unchaperoned, and I'm like, yes. that never would have happened. Yes. Never would have happened. Like, 
I appreciate that it's it's almost fantasy in a way, and that they took a reality and they they retold it. I don't know. It's it's not a legit period drama in my in my mind for many reasons. One of them being the costuming is all over the place. Like it's yeah. supposed to be set in Regency period, but there's dresses from all kinds of time periods throughout this show. And I realize most people probably wouldn't notice or care about these things, but it kind of makes me twitch a little bit. Like there were very defined styles throughout. Yeah time periods in history and they just kind of were like yeah whatever if this matches this person's character i feel like that's where they went with the costuming like um, the queen's costumes, she looks like marie antoinette which is yeah. probably 30 to 40 years in the past when that would have been the style right and then the like the featheringtons the mother i don't even know what her dress I it doesn't even look like anything historical like it's very kind of modern like evening gown almost all the time I don't know so. anyway <laughs> I, I yeah. can rant and rave just about the costumes for like 20 minutes <laughs> yeah so I enjoyed the show it's kind of like Outlander where to me the books are one thing and the show is something else mm-hmm. and I and enjoy them for separate pieces of art. Yes. Uh, spoiler alert for anyone watching who does or does not care about this show. Um, I It really bugs me when TV shows make things up for the sake of the TV show. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I was thinking about this earlier today. Because I was like, I don't get why they added in the cousin who came to stay with the Featheringtons. Right. Totally and- not. In the books. I don't know if it's going to be in a later book. Again, I only read the first two books in the series, and there's like eight or nine books. So I don't know if it's a later plot line that they brought in. I don't think so. It feels like they just threw that in for the sake of it, just like the queen is not a character in the books. Or the prince. Yeah, and like, I don't really... I feel like they're filler. Like, they don't really move the plot line forward. Mm -hmm. They're just there to kind of prop up the main story, which is the love story between the hero and the heroine. So, yeah. Well, and then I'm thinking, like, so I was doing the dishes earlier, obviously thinking about the dichotomy between the show and the book. And I wouldn't care if they made things up for the show if it was a way to capture something in the book that's really hard to translate to the screen. Like, I feel like a lot of what's lost in Outlander and I think in Bridgerton is, like, the inner dialogue the main character has with themselves, which I get it's hard to convey a struggle with a face. But, damn it, you can have them have a conversation with a friend and express all of the feelings that they think in the books. And... I don't know. I just don't get the creative choices of TV shows a lot of time. I realize I'm a purist when it comes to books, but I feel like yeah. you have the recipe for a good story. Why right. do you need to change the recipe? I accept that some things are going to get changed when you adapt them from book to screen, but yeah, sometimes the choices are a little bit baffling. I will agree with that. So. <laughs> So, yeah. I don't know. I would just say if anybody has any recommendations for period dramas or romance books or, you know, anything along those lines, we really like historic fiction and that kind of stuff, especially like the Regency through Victorian Edwardian period. Um, I know we were talking yesterday about picking out a new audiobook and I was like I would just live in the past if I could I tend to stay within those time periods you I like don't to know. I I don't mind a modern story either necessarily it's just I don't know I'm stuck on that I, yeah I yeah. really enjoy some World War II fictions uh because that's kind of where you get this 
post World War II is a major shift in society, and yeah. so it's harder than disbelief. Right. Um, but I enjoy that period as well. My only issue with that is when you listen to a lot of it, it can get really depressing. Yes. Really depressing. Yes. <laughs> so. I feel you are that. Um. So yeah, and I know. In the new year old, oh my gosh, I'm mixing up cows. And our most recent announcement, we said we have an idea for a potential knit along. Mm -hmm. It may dovetail with this historical fiction conversation. I don't know. We haven't figured out the details of it yet or some kind of knit lit club. I don't know. Yeah. Um, so... I don't know either. We'll see. We both just really like to listen to good audiobooks and knits. So. <laughs> and I then know that's uh, super uh, helpful there. <laughs> yeah, and then share our mutual frustrations over yes. characters in the show. So here's another trope that you and I have talked about, and then I we can probably end the call because it's probably long enough as it is. Yes, but. Uh, you and I also frequently complain that in these books, a lot of times things could just be solved by a simple conversation. <laughs> yes, this is extremely <laughs> frustrating to me. <laughs> Which I get. Uh, I get there, if there's no tension, it doesn't drive the story. But at the same time, it's like... It's so frustrating, like, just to have a conversation like normal people. Well, and it's so obvious, either as the reader and or observer, where you're like, Jesus, just sit down and talk. Stop talking in vague circles around each yes. other. Because even sometimes when they're sitting down to talk, it's like, how is anyone that oblivious that you're yes. on the same page, but completely different pages at the same yes. time? So I had, this was a major issue with a book that I read last year, which was a, a contemporary book. It's a, it was a very popular book. It was um, Normal People, which they then made into a Hulu show. And this was actually a case where I preferred the TV show to the book. Um, this book got a lot of praise. It was recommended to me by a friend who also enjoys kind of similar stories and things that we do. Um, but oh my god, this book made me so like mad and just like these characters never got on the same page because neither one of them were mature enough to like express their feelings out loud. And it's just like, who is like this in real life? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> but again, I for whatever reason, I actually enjoyed the show more than the book. I, I think the show was somehow less pretentious than the book was. Mm -hmm. I don't I feel like I'm very much in the in the minority of not enjoying that particular book because again it got a lot of like critical praise. Um not every book is everyone's cup of tea. No, no. I mean there's a there's usually a critic or a critique of anything, but anyway, <laughs> we should probably yeah, end the book talk here. <laughs> So, yeah, if you guys have an idea of a knitting read-along, making read-along of some kind, or how that might function, let us know down below. So, back to that, yeah, I was going to say, if there's, like, knitting patterns that are somehow related to books or stories or time periods or whatever, um, maybe that's a way to link it. I don't know. Let us know down below. Mm -hmm. Um, because yeah, I know we both want to do another make we both enjoy doing make alongs. Um it's a nice way to connect with people. But yeah, we want it to be an enjoyable experience for everyone and find a way to make it interactive or communal. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. Um so yeah. I <laughs> So if you enjoyed today's episode, hit that thumbs up button down there. Leave a comment. If you're not already subscribed, consider subscribing to my channel, to Zoe's channel. Yes. To whoever's channel you enjoy. 
and yes we appreciate y'all we like having yeah. you along for the journey so as um frustrating as putting content out can be uh, like in the editing process or things along those lines it is really fun my favorite part of doing the channel is interacting with people in the comment section yes. so and just having met makers all over the world so. yes i agree <laughs> All right, until next time, you guys, I hope whatever you're making brings you joy. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.